Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for taking the time tonight. Um, this is my first virtual where I can't see your presentation. All I see is the mic and camera in front of me. But um, if you have any questions along the way, I know uh, Ali's going to help me manage questions through the through the live chat and um, my uh, Twitter and everything is at the end of all this. My email's on the screen right now. Feel free to hit me up. I'm also in the Chicago Python Slack. If you want to reach out to me there, I'm happy to take questions and and help out wherever I can. So let's get started. So um, we kind of talked a little about me. I think I'll skip over this one just for, for brevity. Um, so we're going to take a little step back from NLP and we're going to talk about audio data because you, um, at least in, in Dialotech's case and the work that I do, we start from audio data. We start from that phone conversation and then we work our way into the text and then the NLP on top of it. So um, at Dialotech, we're firm believers about um, having cleaned foundational data helps us to um, have better results downstream. If your audio is not in good formats and being properly managed and maintained, um, if, you're, if you're not having good practices there at the audio level, um, it's, it's not going to translate into good results in your transcription, which could lead to uh, issues with some of your modeling and prediction and things like that. So we're gonna talk about audio data. We're gonna talk about tools you can use to explore audio files on your, on your system. We'll talk about ways we can get features from those audio files. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of classification on top of that audio data uh, with an example. And then we're gonna shift into transcription NLP. And there's a lot of, a lot of content here and I wanna make sure Lorena has a, um, a lot of content and time for her, her talk. So I'm gonna be a little brief through some of these early slides, but uh, rest assured the uh, slides will all be shared out. It's, uh, the, the, all the codes in my GitHub, I'm, I'm happy to help you work through it later on or pair up something if you'd like to at the, at the end, um, down the road. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is, is how we as humans actually hear sound. And when you take a step back and think about it, um, what we're really hearing is that um, difference in um, variation of pressure um, that makes sound for us. So that your, your ears are getting sound waves being created by different pressures from my voice speaking out loud. And that's how we hear things. So when you look at that at a, at a, at a human level, at, a, at a, how we hear sound, um, the picture I have up here is of your uh, your ear system from your outer ear to your inner ear all the way through to your nervous system. So when that sound kind of rolls into your ear, down the ear canal, into your eardrum, if you look to the far right, you see a little snail looking thing called the cochlea. Inside that cochlea, um, there is what's called the basilar membrane. That Think of that as like a, a, a strip of, of, um, of hair follicles um, inside there. And as the sound um, moves across it, it starts to make a wave looking pattern. Um, and those hair follicles rub against the cochlea and that generates electricity. Um, when you hear things, you're literally generating electricity inside your, your ears. Um, those signals, that electricity is then transferred to your auditory nerve and that gets carried to your, to your brain for, for us to interpret as, as sound as humans. So kind of parlaying from that, how's a computer hear sound? So on the top of this diagram, you have an, we have an analog um, sound wave, on the bottom, a digital sound wave. And what we're really doing is we're just sampling the data. We're just converting those air pressures in the analog. And over time, at a given sampling rate, we are capturing that information and we're looking at the voltage in that, um, we're calculating the voltage in that uh, signal. And that's giving us our ones and zeros at the, on the bottom digital output. That's, that's kind of a very rough explanation of digital to audio, uh, digital audio conversion. Getting a little bit deeper in the sound wave characteristics, um, the two I always talk about around this are uh, amplitude and frequency. If when you look at amplitude on the left diagram, that's the, the height of the wave um, from zero. So um, I look at it this way, the more amplitude, the higher the wave goes up. Think about like an amplifier, right? If you have an amplifier in your car or your home audio system, um, you're amplifying that sound, you're increasing the, the loudness of it. The, the, um, the, sound wave is getting, the sound wave is getting bigger and taller to give you more amplitude and, and louder sound. Um, on, the, on the diagram on the right-hand side, you're looking at wavelengths. So the shorter the wavelength and the, the higher your frequency, um, the, the more often that wavelength travels across the zero mark, the higher your frequency of sound, and contrary to the, the low frequency with longer wavelengths. Uh, but that's giving you, um, that's gonna translate into the pitch of the sound you're hearing. So you have the loudness and the pitch kind of within these two characteristics. And one thing to really consider when you're talking about working with audio data is how are you sampling that data? How is your system taking the audio being spoken and actually sampling it into your, your files, into your WAV files or your audio files, let's say. 
So on this diagram, we have um, a sound wave in blue, an analog signal, and each of those uh, points in red are the uh, are digital samples. The interval between those those red lines is called the sampling rate. Um, that is just the regular interval that we're, where we're taking a sample of the wave. Um, typically, you're going to see sampling rates ranging from 8 kilohertz all the way up to 22.5 megahertz. Uh, very large spread there. So 8 kilohertz, you can think of as like your typical phone call. Um, uh, for an audio recording like MP3 format, you're going to see like 44.1 kilohertz. The larger kilo, uh, the larger like megahertz type type uh, frequencies are a lot of like high quality production equipment you're going to see in like movie theaters and, and and movie systems and things like that. But the thing I always talk about here as well is it's not just a sampling rate, but it's the bit depth that you need to consider here as well. So the sampling rate is how often you're grabbing a um, a sample of that wave, and of course, the higher the sampling rate, the more often you're taking a sample. Um, so the, bet, the, the easier it'll be for you to reconstruct and play that audio with better quality uh, when you go to, to play it to someone's human ears. But then the bit depth is actually the measure of how much data you're taking per sample. So you're sampling uh, at the sampling rate and you're grabbing the, the number of bits in the bit depth. And typically you're gonna see one, two or three bytes, eight, 16, 24 bits. Um, but the, the thing to remember here and take away from this is that um, the higher the sampling rate, the more often you're sampling, the higher the bit rate, the more data you're getting per sample that you can use for your, for your processing. Another thing to consider as well are the audio file formats. The uh, common audio file formats uh, that we use at Dialogtech are typically WAV files. Uh, we try to keep our sound in the uh, uncompressed loss, lossless format that we can use. Um, so we wanna try to minimize the amount of loss we have in the data in the file when we save it to WAVE so we can put it into our longer term storage after we processed it. Um, you can also use FLAX. Uh, FLAX are um, technically a lossless uh, compressed format. They, they will usually save you around 30 to 40% of, of storage size. Um, the, the issue I've typically seen is that they may not be as widely usable in other systems. You may not be able to play them in all web browsers, other things like that. Um, MP3s are a more standard format, but again, you get to a, a, a lossy com uh, compressed format. You get a lot of space back in your environment. It costs you less to store them in the cloud storage you, know, you save 75, 95% of the, of the size compared to WAV files, but you are uh, you are definitely going to lose um, data when you save down to MP3. So um, things to keep in, in consideration when you're talking about working with audio data and files. Um, some else to consider too here are the number of channels in your data and your application. So typically an audio file with one channel is a mono file. Even if there's multiple speakers on that file, uh, on that sound wave, um, if they're if they're mixed down into one channel, um, one piece of data, that's just a, a mono audio file. Um, typically, a good rule of thumb is to have one channel per speaker in the conversation. Think about a typical phone call. Um, you and I are talking on the phone. You're in channel one. I'm in channel two. This gives us all of the bits of data at the sampling rate within those channels so that we get the best quality data capture per speaker on the, on the conversation. Um, that would, again, parlay into um, if you and I are talking at the same time and maybe we talk over each other, um, there's a better chance of being able to catch some of those words that were spoken if you have the channels separated out um, in the actual wave file. Um, so moving on for some features of audio, uh, quick uh, couple of ideas on some tools. I love socks, love, love, love the tool socks. I install it on a laptop really quickly when I first get one. Um, it's, it's a go-to tool for me in my terminal. Um, typically I use socks dash dash I. Uh, passing in a wave uh, a file uh, path, and then out comes just some very basic high-level data. So when I'm given a new piece of audio, first thing I'm going to do is is socks it and try to see how many channels there are. I have my sample rate, I have my my bit rate, I have um, a bunch of different I have the, the duration, the number of samples. I have all the information there that kind of gets me going on it and gets me started with it. Socks is a really great tool. Um, you can look up its uh, man page on SourceForge. Um, it, it's cross-platform. Works on I'm on a Mac right now. It works on you know, Linux and Windows as well. Um, Python, actually, you can pip install a tool called PySox, um, and that actually will wrap around the Sox uh, tool and, and give you uh, direct access to it in, in your Python code. So in, in addition to uh, Sox, um, if I need to go into the UI and actually see the wave, um, I love the tool Audacity. Um, it's, I, it's a free tool, um, cross-platform. It's It also will do uh, video editing and recording. Um, I typically use it just to get a quick look at the, at the wave file. Um, I can I can see from this point how many channels there are. I see how long the, the wave is. 
I can see kind of where different speakers are in the file. Um, and I can see what's going on with that audio. And I can even play it too to hear the audio. So I can kind of go from my terminal to this tool and I get a lot of information really quickly about a new piece of, a new piece of data. Cool, so let's talk about audio features. Um, so we're gonna take and look at how we can take those, those WAV files. Once we go from analog to digital, we have a WAV file, um, how we can extract those features in Python. So we're gonna look at raw audio features. We're gonna talk about spectrograms, chromograms, and finally, we're gonna talk about MFCCs are, or MEL frequency substrate coefficients. So first up is raw audio data. Um, this is a five second wave file. Um, this is sampled at 44.1 kilohertz. So when you look at this, you're getting a 1D array of five times 44,100. So 221 roughly uh, thousand elements in the array. And I'm just using, um, I'll show you the code in a second. I'm just using some very standard tools to pull this out and extract it. This is actually, if you're curious, this is me speaking. The first couple seconds there are me uh, saying a few words, I forget the actual words. And then um, that very um, large amplitude uh, at the end there is me clapping my hands uh, as well. So using that same audio file, now that we've loaded it in and we have the raw data, now we can do some math to get into the, our other features that we could use for other work. So first thing we'll look at is spectrograms. And, and you're gonna see a trend here over the next three um, feature extraction elements. We're gonna do a lot of Fourier transforms. And, and I don't know about you, but I haven't done a Fourier transform since college. Um, the good news is you don't, know how to, you don't have to remember how to do them or pull out your old um, math books from college or anything like that. There are some tools that I'll show you in Python that you can use to extract that information and work with it. So this is a spectrogram. This is created effectively by taking the audio, uh, the, digital, the digital data from the audio breaking it up into overlapping time windows, and then doing a Fourier transform over each time window. Um, you're calculating the magnitude of the frequency spectrum inside of that actual window. Then you're plotting that with uh, time on the x-axis, um, uh, frequency on the y-axis, and then the heat map is actually the difference in, um, uh, hold on a second here. I have a note on this, so much, I wanna get it right. The, um, the, it's the magnitude of the frequency in the spectrum for that given window. So that's actually your, yeah, your decibels there is your, is your, um, your frequency uh, magnitude. But again, visually speaking, you can kind of see where I'm talking off to the left for the first couple of seconds, and you can see my hand clap there um, off, uh, kind of in the center of the screen. So next are chromograms, and this is a little bit more complex, but chromograms um, are a compare, they're, they're taking your audio and it's a comparison between the 12 different pitch classes. Um, you know, C, C sharp, D, C sharp, things like that. So like a spectrogram, we're calculating this feature by dividing the audio into small windows of time. And then we're doing a short time Fourier transform over them. And then what you have here is time on the bottom. And um, the uh, vertical axis is actually, if you look closely enough, it could be hard to tell depending on how, how big your stream is, but um, you're seeing uh, 12 vertical blocks. Um, for every every segment of time, and each of those blocks indicates a different pitch class. And the and if you look to the right, the the variance in the pitch from your audio to the standard pitch of that pitch class is the is the color. So all the ones that are darker are closer to that pitch class. The ones that are the more in the yellows, oranges, and and all of that at the top, those are where it's differing from the pitch class. So this is simply just doing a lot of comparisons amongst pitch classes for chromograms. So the last one here are um, MSCCs are longer described as MEL frequency substrate coefficients. Uh, try saying that 12 times fast. But um, this is actually much more complex mathematically um, to, to calculate and to describe, to be honest. But the, um, there's five steps. So first you're gonna take, same as our other features, you're going to take the audio, split it into uh, your different time windows, and you're gonna do your Fourier transform on each window. Next, you're going to take that resulting spectrum um, and map it onto the MEL frequency scale. Then you're going to take a log of powers for each frequency in the MEL scale, and then you're going to do a discrete cosine transform of those powers um, into your MFCCs. And then um, an MFCC technically represents a phoneme or a distinct unit of sound. Um, they're commonly used uh, in uh, speech recognition systems, uh, transcription systems, and audio classification in, uh, environments. So again, you have time here on the bottom and uh, you have the value of the MFCCs being indicated by the, uh, the colors. Okay, let's get some code. 
So Ali, can you just confirm real quick that you're seeing the, uh, the code here on the stream? Yeah, it looks good. Awesome, thank you. So, um, so all of this, all these demos are available on GitHub. In my, in my GitHub, I'll give you the link at the end. Um, all of this work is done in Python 3.6, I believe, might be 3.7. Um, and I'm going to talk through all the. And I'm doing, using. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Jupyter Lab, so I'm demoing a Jupyter Lab. So um, I'm going to not go through every line of code here, just for brevity, just to make sure we have time to get to our transcription and, and LP parts of the conversation. But I'm going to point out the keynotes and some of the um, some of the code I have here. So first, thing I want to mention is the package I'm using is called Debrosa. Uh, big fan of Debrosa. Really well baked out package, um, and I like it because it has. Um, the ability to extract features, but it also has um, uh, integration with matplotlib to just generate really nice looking plots that you can use to visualize audio data right here in the notebook. So I have some constants, and then I actually, um, I don't know if my speaker's hooked up here, or my audio, but I, I could play the audio right from the notebook in this next area. And then we're going to start pull, pulling out features. So first thing we do is just load the file up. We, we take the path and we load in the file of repose that load. The main thing I want to point out here is that I'm passing in SR equals none. So I'm saying sampling rate equals none. And that's on purpose uh, because um, I actually get the sampling rate. If you look out to the, the results, I get the raw audio and the sample rate. Uh, the sampling rate is, is determined by Labrosa when it loads the file up. It figures it out. Um, if you were to pass in a sampling rate here, if you did not pass in the actual sampling rate of the audio, if you pass in a different number per se, um, it would upsample or dance, downsample your audio for you, which could be a cool feature depending on what you're doing. Um, I didn't want to do any upsampling or downsampling for any of this, so I just left it as none. I wanted Labrosa to do what it does and, and give me the results. And then again, I'm just using Labrosa that display uh, wave plot, and that's integrating with my uh, matplotlib uh, library and just generating a really nice looking plot of the raw audio as well. And then same thing we're going to go through for the spectrogram. There's a feature mode spectrogram I'm passing in the audio. I now have the sample rate, so I have to give that to the spectrogram so it can do its math. Um, I'm telling it to do um, 512 Fourier transforms um, windows and a hop length of 256 between them. And I, I forget what those parameters exactly mean. That's all in the, in the um, I'm pretty sure those are defaults for this this function. Those are all defined in the, uh, Labrosa also has a lot of great documentation on their website if you go look it up. Um, and then I convert to decibels so I can display on a graph and then we visualize it calling um, spectrum show passing in the decibels and um, time on the x-axis. And, and we're generating our spectrogram here as well, uh, right in this notebook. And then again, same, same system here for chroma. We're, we're calling the chroma function, sort, short time Fourier transforms, passing in the audio and the sample rate. I get all my chroma data back out, the raw data. Um, again, I have those 12 pitch classes. So I have a, a size of 12 uh, for 433 uh, that were calculated. And then I'm calling spec show again, to generate my chromogram with all of those uh, vertical boxes that are in, involved. And then same for MFCC is just passing in um, the raw audio, the sample rate, and the number of MFCCs I want to calculate um, per window, and then visualizing those as well. So that's that's the code. I really like Labrosa because it, it, you know, a couple lines of code here, and you can you can really do some really powerful things with audio uh, with just looking through a couple of quick docs and, and then getting into the uh, the audio side of things. Cool. So now we've talked about um, audio in general and, and some basic ways to get features out. Let's let's solve a problem. Um, so we're going to do an audio classification problem. Um, I found a system called um, FreeSound. It's a um, audio tagging challenge from uh, from Kaggle. I, the data is freely available. I went out and downloaded it. Um, there are forty one different sound classes. Things like applause, fireworks. Um, gunshots, um, uh, different instruments like uh, cellos and trombones. Um, there are over 9,000 labeled examples. So we're going to take a look at how I explored this data, how I um, split it up into data sets, how I attracted the features, how I trained the model, and, and how we predicted on, on new, um, new examples. So again, we're not going to go through all the code direct. Um, I'm using pandas to load up CSVs and map the to visualize some things. Um, I'm reading in the CSV that came in the set. Um, as you can see, I have 9,473 examples. Each example has a file name. So this data set comes with a bunch of files. And then this CSV is kind of like the index, if you will, into those files. And then it also has the data you need to train a model. It has a label. And it has this feature we're going to talk about in a second called manually verify true false. Um, you know, just looking at our data here, we have yeah, 9473. We have 41 classes. If I call 
um, label.unique on, uh, unique on the label column. You can see all the different um, things we have here, glockenspiels, telephones, um, tambourines, fireworks, things like that, finger snapping, um, 41 different classes that are labeled. And the thing I wanted to look at here is that this is a, a open source data set. So I have no idea how the, the labeling process was done, how rigorous it was, if they did um, single labeler per file, or if they did a um, like a voting structure where you have different people uh, label the same file and you take the, I, I don't know how it was done. So what I decided to do for purposes of this exercise is I just did a group by by manually verify and label. And I wanted to see kind of how they distribute, how many examples do we have uh, not verified and verified. And, and some it kind of, I found it varies based on the class. Some classes have a very, somewhat closely evenly distributed like his guitar. Applause is very much not labeled manually or not verified. Um, and this kind of varies by pitch class, and I, uh, um, by, um, kind of by class basically. And I actually wanted to go as far as looking at the visually, I just did a simple stacked bar, bar chart here um, where the uh, blue color is where it's not verified and the orange color is where it is verified. So looking at some of the classes here, um, things like saxophone are very verified. Um, but then you get into a couple of um, like uh, cough and bark are much less verified. So, so we have an a imbalanced situation between the files that are verified and the files that are not verified. So that'll, that'll start to play into how we look at this. So what I decided to do was just ignore and remove all of the non-manly verified data. I just filtered my data set to where that manly verified column is one. I found that that had 3,700 examples still um, and decided to give that a shot and see how that performed from a modeling standpoint. So um, as you can see here, we have all the verified information. So the next notebook I have, it's actually in the repo. I'm not gonna go through it all, but I, I had to make a notebook once I did some exploration, I had to get my data um, lined up and, and kind of uh, uh, allocated to where I needed to have it. So I, I basically wrote a script that would, so I used sklearn to do a train test split. Uh, typically I do 80, 20, 80 for train, 20 for test and validation. Um, and then once I had that set, I then went to the data and I looped over all the files. And I split them into a train file, a train folder and, and a validation folder. Um, that way I had everything set up statically. I tend to do this statically. I prefer that um, from, a, from a data standpoint. That way, if as you train and fit your model over and over again and try different things, um, you're always comparing your metrics of your model and your performance on the same uh, static data set. So we're not gonna go through the notebook. It's just a bunch of code to move files around and do some other fun stuff. But we are going to look at is how we actually train a model with that data. So now at this point, we have split our data in a train test. We're only using the manually verified data. And we have moved all our files around on our local file system. So we're ready to go. So again, I'm importing a lot of stuff. I'm using uh, Labrosa, Matplotlib, um, Pandas again to load data in. Uh, and I'm bringing Keras. So I'm using Keras and TensorFlow to build this model um, that I'm using to, to train on the audio file. So I have a bunch of different uh, constants again, our paths and some other things. Um, and then th we're not gonna go through this code again. We have all the loading code. We have the, the raw audio visualization. Uh, we go through all the other stuff that we do for MFCCs. The important side of this feature to note is this function right here, get MFCCs. Cause I actually loop over all the files and I generate the MFCCs here. And the thing to take away from this is that uh, typically when training a neural network to uh, do a classification problem, you have to get your data into the same size and shape. So in this case, um, I found the audio files to be of varying length by a little bit, half second or so here and there. Um, so what I decided to do was truncate that at 128 MFCCs and anything over that we would chop and truncate anything. If we didn't have enough to get there, we have code that will just pad it in uh, with zeros. So that way we end up with uh, a uniform set of data that we're going to work through. So then further, I just this code here is just looping through my directories and get, gathering all the WAV files. And the, it's these three lines here are the important ones. It's just calling get MFCCs on that file. It's getting those back. It's also it's appending it to the overall MFCC list. And then it's taking the category for that one, feed, that one file uh, and building out the category list. And then what I'm doing here is just converting to a NumPy array for my X features. I'm doing a little bit of pre-processing on the category list. You can't pass a list of strings into um, a model. You have to, you have to pass numbers. Um, so we have our numerical representation of the WAV file in MFCCs, but now we have strings. We have like cello and glockenspiel and other things like that. So all I'm doing on this line is just calling uh, two categorical and the carriage utilities that is effectively doing a one hot distribution. Think of this outputting per, um, per audio file. It's giving back, um, a 40, 41, um, 
entry-wide vector that has uh, 40 zeros, and one of those are going to be set to one for the corresponding class that it is. And then um, one thing I've done that I've learned the hard way is uh, at this point, you've done a lot of pre-processing, save. Save your data. Um, just calling numpy.save to numpy files here. I'm saving my features for X and Y. I'm saving my label encoder. I'm just saving things so that if my, if my modeling uh, borks my system here, I can, I can just reload the notebook and start back over. I don't have to go through that um, data um, extraction process again. So this whole notebook, these next six lines are the model. So I'm using Keras again, so I'm, def I'm building a sequential model. My first layer is, is batch normalization layer. So what, this is tr what I'm trying to do with this is that um, there is, a, as you saw in that one chart, there is an imbalance of examples uh, manually verified across different categories. Um, so what I'm trying to do is ensure that for every batch of data I process, we have relatively equal amounts of data from each category as best we can. Um, just trying to avoid batches that come through that have um, a bunch of trombones and, and nothing of anything else and things like that. Um, then I have two different LSTM layers. I'm using um, LSTMs here um, because I wanted a type of neural network that um, that has memory about previous information because an audio file has a time series component to it. So I wanted a type of model that, that, that observes and uses that, that time series, that memory component. Um, if you haven't used an LSTM before, um, I really love going to, there's a website I can share a link later um, that has all the different neural network architectures um, drawn out really nice and clean. Um, I think it's called Asimov Zoo neuralnetworkzoo.com, I'll, I'll look it up. Um, so I have 128 units and 32 units. I'm using dropout on both of my layers. Uh, what I'm doing there with dropout is I'm trying to avoid overfitting. Um, when I'm setting dropout, what I'm telling it is that um, when you're training this, this layer, randomly select nodes that you're going to remove and, and remove from the, from the network. That way you're trying to avoid different nodes that latch on to features that may not be generalizable to that data so you're trying to avoid overfitting. Um, then I pump all that into a dense layer. That's 41 uh, softmax layer. That's um, 41 um, outputs wide. Um, I'm using categorical cross entropy. I'm using the atom optimizer, and I'm using categorical accuracy as my metrics. And then model.fit, passing in X, giving it the Y. Um, I trained this on a MacBook Pro, so I had to do a very small batch size of 16, and we're doing 50 epochs. And if you look at the results that are pumped out here by the, by the trainer, um, you see this loss column here in the middle. We start off at 3.6. We start training ourselves down to 2.0. And if I keep scrolling down, I get down to like 0.8 or 0 0.9, 0 0.87. Um, so I'm training the loss out of the network and, and trying to make it as um, predictive as possibly can. The um, one thing I kind of do sometimes is look through the summary to see what kind of parameters I have and just kind of double checking that my network sizes look right. And, and yep, 128 makes a lot of sense um, for the MSCCs. And um, that's, my, that's my max size I picked earlier. And then um, we get down to this 41 uh, output uh, size. And again, save it. You've trained it, you spent a lot of time, probably hours training that, um, save it, um, save it to disk. And then next thing we wanna do is see how we did, how, how we're performing. So all I'm doing here is just converting one uh, random file I picked out of the training, out of the validation set um, and converting it to MFCCs. And the next line down there, I'm just calling model.predict. And I'm getting out 41 numbers. Um, those are those are the probabilities per class of what that file is. So to get the actual prediction or the, or the strongest prediction, I'm just doing an argmax on the whole thing. Um, and then I'm indexing into the label encoder classes to get back the uh, string representation of what that class is. And it's a bass drum. So that worked out well. One for one. We're doing pretty good, right? Um, let's, let's keep playing along. So um, what I really want to do is do validation on my entire validation set. Um, so I load that up down here. I have 742 examples. Um, I added a predicted label column, and then this code is just literally over, uh, looping over top of the um, model, excuse me, of the files, getting MSXCs again, uh, model.predict, and then putting that into the data set. Um, and you can see out of the first five, and the, the way I called .head uh, on the data frame, um, three out of five, so we're doing, we're doing okay. But what I really want to see is are my, um, my F1 scores or some kind of metric of how I'm doing per category. Um, and the higher the F1 score here, the better I'm doing. And it kind of is a mixed bag. Doing great on acoustic guitars, uh, kind of a coin flip on buses. Um, really poorly on computer keyboards and other things like that. So, uh, but overall, a, a weighted average of, of, of a 0.6. So uh, a little better than a coin flip. So pretty, pretty good for a, uh, for a MacBook Pro. Um, cool. 
So kind of recapping the results here, um, we built a model using MFCCs on this data set. We came out with an average F1 score of 0.6. Um, kind of okay, not great. Um, you notice that some categories were higher or lower. How can we improve this? Well, some things that we could do are we could um, uh, train for more than 50 epochs. That would probably involve getting off of some other, other hardware uh, using a GPU or some other things to speed things up. Maybe rework how we're truncating features. Maybe try to go to 256 or 512 for our, our size of our features. Um, and then we could possibly tune our LSTM um, or use a, use a different kind of model, maybe a CNN or some kind of RNN style model uh, to, to do this work. So that's a lot about audio and predicting. Let's kind of shift gears into the tech side of things to talk about how we go from audio to text. So again, at Dialogue Tech, we very much are focused on um, having quality data at every step in our process. So we try to get as best quality audio as we can, and then we try to get best quality transcriptions as we can. So um, when you're looking at transcription, uh, you're looking at a couple of things. Number one, you're obviously converting recorded conversations to text, recorded audio to text. Um, and then you're, you you want to use as high quality equipment as you can. Sometimes you can't control it. For uh, the work that we do, it's all, it's all usually phones, uh, phone receivers, cell phones, desk phones, things like that. Um, if you can control your uh, equipment using high quality mics and things like that, awesome. More the better off you are. Um, you want to try to set the lossless formats, waves, and flat files. And again, you want to record one speaker each channel. And depending on your environment and when your needs for transcription, you might use an API. Uh, you might do some on premise. It just depends on what you want to do. You can hand roll. You can roll your own and train your own model. There's toolkits out there like Caldi and other things like that. There's some notes on Caldi in the in the slide deck uh, if you want to grab it when, when we when we post it. But um, you can, you can do lots of different ways to do your transcription depending on what's best for you and, and for your needs. If you do choose to go to the cloud with it and do an API, um, one thing that my team tries to stay on top of is the ever ever changing models and, and quality of our transcription providers. And some of the ones we normally test around this slide, um, we test at AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. Um, we, we typically will take a standard set of audio files and we'll run them through these vendors and we'll do what's called a word error rate calculation um, per, per, um, per audio file. And what that really is calculating, uh, if you look it up, is just um, the ratio of insertions and deletions, basically differences in the, in, the, in the text versus the number of words that should have been in the text. So it's kind of trying to figure out the ratio of, of how uh, good or bad it did on that given call. Okay, quick demo on that. So next up here, we're gonna talk about transcribing audio files. And um, I'm gonna skip over all the little Brosa stuff. We've been through all of that and I wanna keep us moving. So um, we're gonna roll down to uh, the bottom here to the last section of this. Um, what I'm really doing with this is I'm just loading up and doing chromograms and everything and, and pulling features from um, debates. So um, I do that for every debate that we have the, um, in the 2016 cycle. So I downloaded some audio from the debates in that cycle, um, and I, I had them transcribed through um, AWS Transcribe. So I'm trying AWS here, and I really like this, this tool. It's a really great, um, really well baked into the AWS um, system. If you're, if you're already using AWS for other, other workloads in your system, it, it shouldn't be a, a very large leap to pull it into your environment. So um, in Python, I'm using Boto3. I'm just starting up a session. And step one is I'm uploading the audio file to, um, we're using MP3s here. So I'm uploading an audio MP3 file into uh, this bucket key um, for uh, transcribe. I'm just doing a quick post to the bucket, putting it up there. And then I'm loading up the transcription client and I'm telling it to transcribe, uh, giving it a job name, um, passing in the sample rate, passing in the, the bucket I wanna put it out to. And then I walk away, it goes and does its thing. Um, and then you can just, uh, when it's ready, you can use the S3 client again to download that transcription and pull it out of the bucket uh, and download it to your local system to work with. And if you're curious what one of those look like, I happen to have a couple right over here. So when you're looking at transcription systems, you wanna look at a couple of different things. Uh, number one, you want a system that gives you back the entire transcription. I'm not gonna blow it out or it'll just kill my browser. But you also wanna look at one, uh, a system that gives you each word individually. And if I look at a random word here in the first couple, um, you also, it's really great that they can give you the start times and end times of those words. It'll help out with other an analysis later so that you can um, line up those words and you can see what kind of words are being said at different times in the call. You, you don't just want this the string of text. It's, it's really good to get other um, metadata around each, each spoken word. 
Um, and when I, when I go into the word here, I actually say that the person was saying here uh, was the word at this at this uh, index into the call. And the confidence rate, if you get a confidence rate from your vendor, all the better, because um, you can use that downstream in some of your processing. Maybe you want to throw out words below a certain confidence threshold or things like that. Um, or maybe you want to calculate the confidence for the entire sentence based on the words in it. And if it falls below a threshold, you want to uh, remove that sentence from your modeling and or other things. So if you if you find data that's not, um, get your system's not um, confident in that it got, it got a good transcription on. Okay, so now that we've gone from text, uh, now that we've gone from audio to text and transcription, we're gonna talk about some NLP. Uh, we're gonna talk about lexical analysis, um, syntactic, syntactic analysis, and, and semantic analysis. Um, and, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at three different examples. We're gonna talk about keyword spotting, um, ways you can look up just simple keywords um, and search through these calls. Um, we're gonna talk about topic modeling and um, we're gonna wrap up with sentiment analysis. So um, we'll talk to the demos. A lot of good code to go through. So um, first thing we're going through here is, so again, I'm using the, the debate uh, MP3s. I'm using the .json files, the transcripts. All I'm, put that away, there we go. Um, all I'm doing here is opening up the transcript. I'm loading the entire transcript here. I'm not going word by word. I'm just loading up the entire string of text. And I'm doing some very basic pre-processing. I'm just removing stop words of the things like that is those kind of words, just pulling out some very basic stop words. And then I'm, oh, I didn't mention, I'm using uh, Jensen. I really love, there's lots of different tools you can use for this kind of stuff. There's NLTK, there's Jensen. Um, I, I, I'm blanking on the other ones that are out there, but there's a lot of tools in this space you can use for text cleansing and other things like that. But I like Jensen too, because they also give you some really cool um, methods you can use. So I'm just calling the summarization.keywords here and I'm telling it to give me back a bunch of keywords. And I'm looking at the first 20. So, so we're looking at the, the 20 most used keywords in this first debate in our 2016 cycle. And we're seeing things like countries, um, Americans, uh, businesses, we're talking about a lot of economic things, businesses, um, the, the Donald, things like that. Then we're looking, equally interesting could be what's not being talked about or what's being talked about less, what kind of, um, in terms of a debate, what kind of topics are candidates pivoting from and not speaking about too much. So some words that come up at the bottom of the list and least common words are um, hoping, sitting, foreign. We must have punted on foreign affairs discussions in this first debate, um, private, things like that. So I did that for each debate in here. We're not gonna go through all, all of them, but just a really easy couple lines of code to go from a transcription to just some very basic keyword-based insights into that, into that conversation. So again, kind of parlaying into the next um, side of this, maybe you don't wanna just look up a list of keywords. Maybe you wanna look up and see um, all the different keywords that are being used, or you wanna be able to search for, for given keywords. So um, again, I'm using a tool uh, in Gensum. I'm loading up my debates. I'm loading up, um, in this case, I'm loading up all the debates at one time, uh, debate one, two, and three in the VP debate. And I'm just calling get text on those files, getting the text out. And then I'm doing some, again, some basic pre-processing, right? So I'm I'm actually, in this case, I, I went to sentences. So I'm I'm calling Jensum's uh, get sentences function. So for every debate, I'm just going through each sentence. And for each sentence, I'm doing some cleansing steps. I'm removing the stop words again. I'm stemming text, uh, removing punctuation and stripping any kind of extra white spaces from that sentence. And then I add them to a, um, a list of clean sentences and then add those to a list of docs. Important to note here too, there's two different, lots of ways to clean text. Um, but sometimes I bounce around between stemming your text and doing what's called uh, lemmatization on your text. And, the, and the, the key difference there in my mind is um, they're both trying to get to the root of words. And it's really good for cases like this when you're trying to do keyword searching because if you're if you're trying to search for, um, let's say, uh, the word drive, you know, drive drives driving things like that. You you don't if you want to not have to put in all of those permutations of the word, you can go back to its stem and look for any use of that word. Um, but when you do stemming, uh, a stem can in some cases be a non-English word, uh, the stem of a given word. Uh, with a lemma, uh, lemmas will be that smaller version of the word that that stripped down version but lemmas are typically guaranteed to be, to always stop at a given English word. So in this case, I'm also searching for the word taxes. I wanted to know in these debates, where are we talking about taxes? So I have my search phrase of the taxes. And I'm, I, one thing I always do is you do the same thing to your, the text you're going to search to your search call, uh, phrase. 
Um, that way they're they're one to one apples to apples comparison, and you're not trying to do searching um, on words that are not following the same pattern that the search criteria of the of the overall text. So I'm calling the same four functions. Um, and as you can see, when we cut down to stems with this, we get to tax. So now we're gonna look for the word tax in all of you. So all I'm really doing here is looping over um, all the docs. I'm just searching for these keywords. Um, and then I, at the end, I print out that uh, basically about 40-ish times and these debates talk about taxes. Um, we talked about them less. The first two rows there are the, are the presidential debates. As we led up towards the, um, the, the trend was downward in discussion about taxes as we got closer to the election. People wanted to avoid talking about them, so it seems. Um, but again, you can put in any search phrase you want in this notebook, and you can do lots of searching for different phrases or, or things being discussed. You can look for different words. So, so that's um, a couple of examples around keywords. Um, let's take another look at a couple more options here. Just checking my, checking my time real quick. Um, so further, um, we're gonna talk about topic modeling. So, what we've done so far has been this been kind of 101 level. We're just we're just looking through our text for um, for different uh, for different keywords and phrases, um, which in a lot of cases is very helpful. Um, you can build very complex algorithms around uh, different keywords and phrases and and the number of occurrences they happen in those in those conversations. If you pull in those those numeric features for your timing for your timings, you can determine if um, those discussions. Looking at a phone call, you can talk. You can see if those key phrases and words are being used up front in the beginning part of the call? Are they being used during the middle discussion or are they being, being used during the call to action at the end? Um, things like that. You can kind of start to, to add different aspects to your analysis, to your data, just by getting more information from keywords and, and the surrounding metadata around those keywords. But if you want to do a little more unsupervised approach, we can do some topic modeling. So uh, in this example, we're using Jensen again for cleaning. That's kind of a trend through all these notebooks. Um, we bring in um, NLP to help out, help us out with some parsing, and we. Um, I really love this tool I found called Pi LDA Viz that we'll, we'll look at the end. Um, and again, we're loading up our transcriptions, we're loading up our data, we're defining a couple helper functions. Um, we're using space, space for our lemmatization, so we're looping over all of our sentences and doing lemmatization here. We're just kind of defining some functions up front. Uh, our list of files here, and then we're looping over. Um, all of the files, we're doing some very simple pre-processing, we're moving stop words, we're calling our lemmatization function, passing in all of our, our data, and then we're creating um, a dictionary uh, from our corpora using Gensum, and then we're, we're creating a, a, a bag of words uh, implementation of a corpus from that data, we're generating a bag of words, because uh, we need to pass those into the overall LDA model. And um, LDA stands for, I'm gonna try to pronounce it right, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, it's a statistical-based, um, unsupervised um, topic modeling um, uh, tool uh, function that I'm passing in my corpus, my dictionary, um, my number of topics. I think I put 10 in here. You can make that a parameter, and you could kind of play with it a little bit. Um, and then when you when this is all done running, this is going to load up all the text, and it's it's generating um, different uh, topics, if you will. And for every word inside of those topics. For every word is trying to see which topic it groups into better, which ones are is it more similar with, where does it fit? Um, and then you can print it right here, right? And this is super helpful, but you can definitely see the first five um, topics give you um, their uh, score and then the, uh, the the word, which is looks really complex to parse in general. Uh, but um, I like to visualize things, so I love Pi LDA Viz. Um, you can pip install it on your local environment. You can run it in notebook mode. You can run it in um, uh, in a script, if you like, as well, to generate these outputs. But this is going to give you a uh, cluster plot of your topic model, so you can you can provide a little better viz around your um, um, your uh, implementation. And I, I know working with my product manager Lori at Dialog Tech, that she is a huge fan of viz. We talk about it all the time, and I, I know I've shown her this, and she loves it. But um, the data didn't work out that well here for me. It really clustered really heavily around one, and uh, not so great around these other clusters. But what you can do here is when you hover over one. It highlights the words, and you're you're seeing the top 30, I believe, most salient topics. And um, this, I think I zoomed in a little too much here, and it's, it's cutting things off. But these, um, the graph to the right, are telling you the um, how often or how frequently they're being used in the overall corpus. So the ones with the longer bar, it would be a little longer if I had not zoomed in. 
um, are being used a little bit more. But you can see in this topic, this topic picked up on things like American, president, um, state, secretary, um, things like that. And you can play with the parameters on this and try to get this uh, tweaked and dialed in all day long. Um, it's a really cool tool to do some, some uh, topic modeling with your, with your system, with your text. Okay, so finally we're gonna finish up with sentiment analysis. And um, so in sentiment analysis, you're trying to look at the text in your um, transcription and you're trying to get a feel for the polarity of the conversation. Um, and you're looking at that from, a, from, the, from the lens of um, positive, neutral, and negative, right? So um, I actually changed it up and pulled in NLTK here, and I'm using a tool called, um, called Vader within the Natural Language Toolkit. Uh, I actually have a link here to the paper for Vader, uh, but it's basically is a, um, it's a rules-based sentiment analysis trained on, I, I believe it's Twitter data. I'd have to go look that up. Um, I, I'm not sure what they use to train it on text-wise, but the, um, all I'm doing here is just implementing LTK, again, loading my transcriptions. I'm um, tokenizing each sentence, creating my tokens. I'm generating a, I'm creating a sentiment intensity analyzer object. And then I'm looping over each sentence and getting the sentiment score for the, for the given sentence and adding it to my output array. And at the end here, I'm just taking my overall scores, positive, neutral, negative, and dividing them by the number of sentences to kind of get a ratio overall and I can see that of my 1,181 sentences, um, fairly neutral conversation in that first, uh, this is the first, first debate I used here. Yeah, first debate. Um, fairly neutral conversation. Um, there was a little bit of uh, positive conversation in there as well, 0.13. Um, not a lot of negativeness as far as what Vader thinks. Um, so with anything in data science, get more opinions, do more, uh, do more analysis, see what other tools say or what other models say or other fits say. Um, so I also wanted to show all of you, if you don't want to um, uh, build your own sentiment tool, uh, there's an API for that as well. Uh, and again, going back to the AWS ecosystem, uh, the AWS Comprehend API is super straightforward to use, um, kind of pluggable right into the Boto3 architecture. So again, I'm opening up this text transcript. I'm um, creating a Comprehend client in Boto. And the only, I guess, downside to the Boto uh, to the AWS Comprehend API is that it has a max of 5K bytes. So you can only send 5,000 characters to it at one time. So when I'm passing it into the text sentiment, I'm actually just passing in um, the first 5,000 bytes here in my, in my uh, object. And then out comes my result. Overall, it was neutral, but I get the score by category. Um, neutral was an overwhelmingly 0.75, um, positive 0.18, and uh, in, in negative 0.2. So that kind of that kind of gels with what we got before. We're only looking at the first 5,000 bytes, but we got overwhelmingly neg negative, and we got a you know a, a little bit of positive kind of sprinkled in there. That's only for the first 5,000 characters, the first you know x amount of minutes or time of the debate. What happened at the end of the debate? You know what what did the discussion change? Did they get more negative? Was there more mudslinging? Uh, what happened? So. What we can do here is we're passing in the bottom, the, the final 5,000 characters into the into the debate, into the transcription, uh, into the Comprehend API, and out comes uh, a little more negative at this point. Um, so our negative number went up to 0.6, and we're leaning a little more negative. We got a little bit uh, muzzling here down the stretch as we wrap things up, so it seems. Um, so again, just different things that you can do with sentiment uh, APIs, different toolkits. Um, you can you can always train your own sentiment model if you'd like as well. Um, but there's lots of good things to, to glean from, from gathering sentiment of your, of your texts, of your conversations. So um, this is actually a quick picture I'm going to show. This is uh, um, not of data I was using, but of uh, different data. This is a really cool looking cluster. I think it might actually be from the uh, PyLDA Viz website, but um, you can Google PyLDA Viz. It's a really, really helpful tool for, um, for visualizing the data. And you can kind of see, um, the top three most relevant tokens, and then um, the the bars are showing you the um, usage of those tokens inside of the inside of the, the corpus. Uh, and the sentiment analysis again. What, some of the things you can do with stuff like this is um, voice of the customer type things. Think about customer service. Um, could you build a system that in real time is calculating um, the polarity and the and the sentiment of the conversation between your agent and the and the caller? And if it goes uh, below a certain threshold or a certain feature characteristics, could it, could it flag a supervisor or let someone know to, to hop in and help this person out? 
Um, and you can also use it in the inbound outbound sales market to see um, how well your products are being received by the, by the customer you're speaking with. So in summary, uh, we talked about analog and digital audio data characteristics. We talked about how we can get audio um, features from that audio data. We talked about ways that we could train a machine learning model with audio data. We went through a, a, um, a transcription example, and we talked about different ways to do natural language processing with um, uh, different tools and different APIs and um, being able to extract keywords and uh, do some unsupervised topic modeling and, and finally wrapped up with some uh, sentiment analysis of, uh, of, uh, of debates. Uh, and that's it, everybody. That's um, Thank you all for your time. I'm super stoked to come out here. I, I at least feel closer to Chicago talking to all of you. Um, not that I'll talk to people every day at work who are in Chicago, but um, I look forward to coming back to the city at some point and, and seeing hopefully some of you in, in person six feet away. But um, here's the GitHub where this all is at. Um, we can post it in the Slack channel maybe later, Lee, if you like, and uh, there's my email address. And uh, you can find me on the Twitters or in the Chicago Python Slack. Uh, if we have time before Lorraine has to get started, I'm happy to take a few questions and, and talk through some things. But thank you all for your time and um, hit me up any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. Can we please Welcome. give Ryan a round of applause in the chat? That was a fantastic <laughs> talk. I learned a lot about, I mean, this is also my second time seeing it, but I learned a lot more, <laughs> understood a lot more this time. Uh, we did have some questions trickling in, but if you do have questions, please ask them down below. And if you did like this uh, talk, go down and hit that like button. Show Ryan how much you really liked it. Awesome. Uh, so the first question is coming from Tony. Do you know if limiting the number of MFCCs affects the accuracy of your model? Yes, I think it does. I actually, um, so when I was building this, so at the time I did, so in the time between I built this talk and, and, and when I, um, um, and now I actually did not have a really nice gaming rig or, or machine learning rig at home. I actually have it sitting like two feet away from me uh, with an, uh, a Titan X uh, or actually a 10 ETI uh, GPU. So I, I was kind of limited to just burning uh, my MacBook Pro to the ground and seeing if it could, it could manage. So I was using probably uh, smaller, um, less MFCCs. And I, I tried to expand it out a little bit and shorten my batch size. And I did see a little better results, but I kept, I kept, uh, I actually, crashed my computer one night, letting it train overnight. So I decided to, to punt on that and just stick with what worked. Um, but no, I actually would, if somebody wants to grab this code, I may even try it on my, mach on my machine. If you if you tried to get a little larger, maybe, maybe go up to 256 of the MFCCs or whatever it might be, um, you you would see, I forget the exact numbers, but I think you would see some some better results. Was that uh, like a pandemic build for your PC? <laughs> no, I actually built this um, some sometime in the last year. I forget exactly when I did it, but... Uh, yeah. No, I, I wanted a machine that I can play um, some uh, some games on, and I also have it still building into Linux, so I, I can throw some data on here and play around with it. I actually set it up to where um, I can SSH to it from anywhere in the in the world. I have a uh, DNS into it, things like that too. So that's awesome. Really helpful if you're working with a lot of data. If you don't want to carry that data around with you, um, you can just SSH in from Wi-Fi and and do your thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I always say I'm making a PC for neural networks, but uh, Crusader Kings 3 is coming out, and I think definitely think that's even, that needs a new build. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so do you see any problems trying to identify sentences from off-the-cuff speech? Are there problems with run-ons and incomplete sentences? Do you or does GenSim have ways of dealing with this? There, there can be problems. I am I'm unaware of how GenSim handles it. I've not gone into it that deeply, but um, there's... There can be problems with um, off-the-cuff sentences, but there can also be problems with some transcription systems don't put the proper punctuation in. Um, so, because they're kind of guessing a little bit, so to speak. You're kind of, I, I, you're, you're basically, if you think about the transcription system, you're looking for uh, a pause. And how long of a pause do you get before you put a period in there? Um, it, it, it may not be as accurate as you would like it to be. So when going to sentences, sometimes it can, it can get a little bit uh, more challenging. I, I have not found great ways to, to work with that. Sometimes you just have to play with hyperparameters and, and try to get as close as you can. Awesome. Uh, so Here's we have question. another question. Uh, for LTA, how many? How do you decide how many topics you're going to use? So I try to start small so that I can kind of see how things cluster and, and not put a lot of stress on my system. So I'll start like around three or five and then go out to 10. And you can, you can start to see um, one thing you're looking for sometimes is the amount of overlap. If you do like 100 clusters, if they're all overlapping over each other, those are not um, technically linear, linearly separable. So when you try to model on them, it could be hard to pick out different features. Um, so you kind of want to just, I, I literally, I just keep messing around with hyperparameters and trying to find that sweet spot where I'm minimizing my overlap 
um, but but getting enough clusters to re represent my text. And and kind of from there, that's just more giving you intuition into the data. If you're if you're going to use that text data for any kind of modeling or things like that, you're going to want to do human labeling, um, classification, and other other stuff so you can you can have more uh, human eyes on that data. It's kind of more of an intuition uh, and, and helpful research. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like a lot of these answers are, it depends on what you're trying to do. A lot of times, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I believe this is related to the sentiment analysis. So what does the compound score type mean? What's up, Darius? Um, <laughs> there's actually a colleague of mine at, uh, at Dialog Tech. So What's up, Darius? Thanks for joining the stream. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. Um, so I, I actually... I forget why I, I ignored the compound sentences. I think I wanted to keep it simpler for this, but I I, I think compound was some of that back to the run on question a little bit as well. It, it was more of a of a, of a compound um, phrases that, that got put together in a, in a weird way. Uh, I'm not really sure what else. I had to go look at it. I, I I know in my analysis it didn't it didn't look. I'm not sure it even had any compounds. I I put that code in because I just wanted to prevent it getting into the. I really wanted to stick to that um, neutral uh, neutral positive negative. Stuff. Awesome. And so uh, our last question is, do you have any free transcription tool recommendations? Wow, great question. Um, a lot of these vendors, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I think AWS will give you um, um, free hours. If you're if you're in a Microsoft world, um, uh, Azure does a lot of this as well. I think if you have like a, a .NET subscription, they give you like X hours per month. So I've known a lot of people that will try to maximize their free hours from the subscriptions as well. And if you sign up for uh, accounts from Amazon, you get those free like intro accounts. They usually uh, give you 25 or hundred hours or things like that as well. Um, but I, I, I don't have a good example of one that's totally free all the time. I, I've honestly not found that per se. Um, if you want a free one, I would actually look into building my own. I would go look at Caldi or some other toolkit that you can find different data sets and train uh, your own transcription system from, from that, if, if that suits your needs. But if you wanted to do a quick API, I would find some way to kind of juggle my way through email addresses and getting Amazon to give you some, uh, some transcripts back. Awesome. So I guess I have a question. Have you ever analyzed sure. like this talk? Uh, no, honestly, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I actually just found a really great data set um, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's published by Google. It's called Audio Set. If you, if you Google the word Audio Set or Audio Set um, Training Set or whatever it might be, um, Google published it, and it's actually a set of video clips from YouTube. Um, and the data set is is a link to the YouTube clip, and the I, the duration and offset of the of the sound of the bird or the car or whatever it might be. And um, I really want to play with that because what you have to do is actually access the audio. Uh, from the way from the from the video. So in this kind of a of, of a of a stream like we're doing now, you have to find a way to segment um, the video out and just get to the audio component from that. And I believe there I have not done it. I believe there are tools in the Python world. I'm sure there are to do that. But uh, but no, I actually that'd be kind of cool if I actually could I analyze this and find ways to improve it. That's a that's a great point. So I think uh, like so when we're doing it on YouTube, like tomorrow morning, it's going to get processed overnight, and uh, we're going to have everything like captioned as well. So if you want to play around with the data. It's all available to you. Captions definitely help too. That's great. Yeah, I might do that for sure. Okay, I'll, I'll hit you up if you need help with the API to just get that information. Cool. Awesome. And uh, before we let you go, do you have any calls to action for our community? Oh wow, calls to action. Um, you know, I, I, I've been following the Cleveland and Chicago um, COVID responses and talking to a lot of people, and I, I think. Um, a lot of people are doing a lot of good things to keep themselves safe, and I just encourage you to keep doing that. Um, now, now is the time to um, invest in yourself while you're at home and while you're kind of staying distant. Uh, you're not going out to to, to, to bars and grabbing drinks with friends. Um, there's a lot of stuff we just talked about. Um, you can you can look into Kegel course, uh, um, Coursera courses, or other things like that, and and use some of your time. You know, crack a crack a cold one at home and and uh, and, and learn something. So uh, that's that's what I'm trying to do, and I would encourage everyone that has the time to. To try to do some of that as well, but uh, definitely stay safe and uh, and try and learn something while you're at home. Yeah, that's definitely fantastic advice. Like, I think one thing we should do is after this is all over, maybe like a pandemic project night where you show off what you've done, like a show and tell. <laughs> Great I've, idea. I've worked cool on idea. a lot of small things, but nothing like well, nothing good yet. I can't wait to figure out what's next. Awesome. Uh, I'll just want to say before I go, I, uh, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate what what you and what Chai, uh, Chai Pai do for uh, for the community, both nationally and in Chicago area. I mean, this is this has been a really well put together event, and um, 
as they all are. And uh, you know, thanks for having me. I, I hope to hope to have one at our Dialtech offices or or join another stream in the future. That'd be great. Thanks so much for uh, for coming on, and I really appreciate you saying that. And uh, we look forward to uh, to having you back on. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.